Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. It's been this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And boy, what a lineup of guests we've got today. First of all, Sonny Morton's coming up in about 10 minutes, a nationally renowned genealogist. She's going to talk about adding detail to your family stories. And has she got an example for you from her own family stories? Amazing stuff. Curtis Rogers is going to be here later in the show. He is, of course, the founder of JedMatch.com, which was recently sold. He's going to tell us what led to that and what the company's about and what the benefits are going to be for all of us. And then uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates returns to talk about the latest episode of Finding Your Roots on PBS. And of course, at the back end of the show, we'll do Ask Us Anything, answering your questions on Extreme Genes. Hey, if you haven't signed up yet for our weekly Genie newsletter, hey, take care of it. It's on our Facebook page. You can do it through our website, ExtremeGenes.com. And you can also sign up to be part of our patron club. And with the patron club, there are all kinds of benefits for you, basically for the cost of maybe a hamburger lunch. Just get signed up and you can get bonus podcasts, early access to the podcast as well, and other benefits. Right now, though, let's head out to Boston and talk to David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? You and know? by the way, mm. I remember dates really well. Yes, you do. Happy 50th anniversary, sir, for being <laughs> on the air. Yeah, actually, you're right. This past week, 50 years since I first cracked a microphone in radio. Back in 1970, I was a teenager in high school, and we had a club that got actually some airtime on a local radio station in Connecticut, and that's where all this craziness started. So... Uh, whoever imagined it would turn into all this, but I'm thrilled. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. I just want to ask one question. Did you know Marconi? <laughs> he was a very close personal friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you, Family History News is really exciting, and this one everyone in the United States is going to take part in, or at least we hope so, the 2020 census. Yes, and it's begun. Mm-hmm. And I think that probably most of our listeners won't be around when it's released in 72 years, so get the information down correctly. Alaska is going to be started first because it is so remote. And I can tell you, I remember doing the census in 2010, Fish, and I had to make annotated notes on the side. My sister being the head of household, the next column related to head of household was brother. My wife, there was no column for sister-in-law. So I had to annotate on it. My wife is the sister-in-law to the head of household, and my daughters are the nieces of the head of household. Hopefully they get it fixed this time. Wow. Yeah, you're right. That's kind of weird that they would leave that out. Well, the next story is really interesting. Of course, you know, Pearl Harbor is one of the stories that's near and dear to our heart. Of course, we had our veteran from the Arizona on the show. And Dory Miller was a hero from Pearl Harbor. He has long since passed away. But Dory Miller is being honored by having an aircraft carrier named after him. In fact, he was the first African-American to receive the Navy Cross for Valor for his heroic actions in World War II at Pearl Harbor. Yeah, and the story is is that he was a cook on the ship, and it was being attacked by the Japanese, and he went up and manned Mm -hmm. a machine gun, started firing back. He did. uh, I'll tell you. It's a shame that he didn't survive after the war. He unfortunately died on a ship that was torpedoed two years later in 1943. 1943. But, I mean, he's an iconic figure and the first African-American to have a ship named after him. Very cool. 
Well, our next person I want to mention was also in World War II in the Pacific during the war. His name is Bob Vollmer. The interesting thing about this 102-year-old, he's not in a nursing home. He's retiring his job. He's worked for the Department of Natural Resources in Indiana and decided, yeah, it's about time to retire. Isn't that something? 102 years old, he's still been working, born in 1917. Well, he said that I guess your body tells you when it's time to go, and doctors <laughs> tell me that the reason I'm still going is I get good lungs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, the secret of living long is having healthy lungs. Take it from Bob, who's 102 <laughs> out in Indiana. you got to take it from him. That's great. Well, I'll tell you, I heard a creepy story, not around Halloween, but the one on Extreme Jeans kind of gave me the willies, pal. The idea of a guy in Wisconsin smoking his mother's ashes just takes it yeah. to another level. Yeah, this is really strange. This is the cremains of his mom, and I guess he uh, he wrapped this up with marijuana. Is that right? Yeah, he cut the drug with his mother's ashes and ingested it. But didn't we have a lady a couple of years back that ate her mother's ashes a yeah. spoonful a day? Yeah. She, she must be related somewhere. Some, somehow there's a tie there. I don't know. Something upstairs is a little bit off. I guess the moral of the story is what not to do with your parents' cremains. Right. <laughs> That's just very strange. He has been arrested, by the way. <sighs> so technically his mother's been arrested, too. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Oh, gosh. The next thing I want to talk about is correction in geography. The Netherlands is now asking the world not to call it Holland anymore. Yeah. And it makes sense. I mean, if you think of the expanse of what technically Holland is, I mean, the places like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Leiden, The Hague, I mean, these are tourist traps of sort. And, you know, I can understand they don't want it kind of pulled into one part. Actually, there's a north and south part of Holland. Right. And and that's just a region. There's North Holland, South Holland, which is part of the Mm -hmm. Netherlands. And they're getting overrun with tourists. So they're going to try to spread them out and get people to go to other parts. For instance, uh, my wife's family came from uh, Luarden, which is to the north in Friesland. But they don't have quite the same problem with tourists in places like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to correct all your genealogical charts now and don't put Holland. No. It's the Netherlands now. Well, that's all I have this week. But again, happy anniversary. And for those of you who want to go one step further in your genealogy, you can always go to AmericanAncestors.org. If you're not a member, you can use that coupon code, EXTREME, and save $20 on a membership. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Sunny Morton. She is back on the show talking about how you add detail to your family stories, how you find that detail and then report it. And she's got an amazing story she found in her own research that you're not going to want to miss. Plus, Curtis Rogers later on in the show talking about the sale of Jed Match, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, a loaded show when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher, and my friends at Memory Web just keep making things better and better. In fact, they just released their new desktop uploaders. Now, what does this mean? Well, they're optimized for speed and ease of use, and they've added some incredible cool things for functionality. For instance, thousands of photos can be uploaded quickly and you'll likely find photos you forgot about or thought you lost. And this happens you know, pretty much to everybody. Through the uploader, your photos come in automatically tagged with an album name from your last two folders, like 2019 or Thanksgiving, and you can export all the photos from your account with metadata fast. And you can select specific albums of photos to exploit with metadata. Yes, this is the photo app made by family historians for family historians. you got to look into it. Go to memory memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. That's memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Get 2020 off to a great start with memory web. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as 
well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Thanks to technology, discovering your family's story is easier than ever. You can discover yours at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Register today for Roots Tech 2020. Don't miss this incredible four-day event, February 26th through 29th. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. Use Promo code HOLIDAY and get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy, and DNA event. February 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. Welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And one of the things I enjoy, and I know you enjoy because you've told me many times, is you love hearing stories that people have uncovered about their ancestors and how they found the details of those stories. And my good friend Sonny Morton, who's been on the show before, is one of America's great genealogists, has a great tale right now. How are you, Sonny? I'm well. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to have you. Tell us about your adventure with your ancestors and how you uncovered it and went along for the ride. Absolutely. So I'm a big travel bus myself, so I love any kind of travel story. So I'm going to tell you a travel story that's a couple hundred years old. And as I do, keep in mind your own road trips, whatever kind of travel you've done before, and sort of compare it. Because that's something I really like is to see both how universal our human experience is, but also how very particular some of the details are from time (laughs) period to time period, right? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the kids in the old days would actually say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I have to go to the bathroom. (laughs) We're going to just pee off the side of the wagon, right? (laughs) (laughs) All right, I have a story to tell about Thaddeus Pond from Vermont. Doesn't it just sound like the name of someone from Vermont? Yes, Thaddeus Pond, yes. So he was born in about 1770, just before nationhood. So he was growing up while we were still getting used to the whole idea of being a country. So right as he was becoming a young man in the 1780s, the U.S. government formed the Northwest Territory, the Wild West of its time. But what they called West, the Northwest Territory, was Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin. That was really our first national frontier. Right. Back when Western Pennsylvania and New York were still kind of the boonies. That's right. So there weren't roads, there weren't canals, or heavens, there weren't railroads, of course, to take the folks into this frontier. There were no rest stops, no McDonald's, no Cracker Barrel. Ugh, I couldn't no do it. Just bathroom. shoot me right now. <laughs> right. So... If they wanted to get there, they just had to figure it out for themselves and cut down all the trees that were in the way. Well, they wanted that free land. They wanted to be able to expand and breathe. They did. And we don't really understand that until we stop and think about how crowded things got when there were 10 kids for every acre of land. There just wasn't space for everybody, every kid in the family to spread out and do their own thing. So we enter the story in 1801. Our friend Thaddeus, he's 31 years old now. He's married. He's got two kids. One of them is six years old, so like first grade age. And one of them is just a year old. So apparently he and his wife, Louisa, were eyeing the whole Northwest Territory idea. They weren't content to live out their lives in Vermont. And I have no idea why. Well, don't you think it's just because, you know, the biggest crop in New England is rocks when it comes to farming, right? (laughs) 
Well, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad at all about Vermont. Well, I no, love- it has nothing to do with Vermont or Vermont people. It yeah. has to do with glaciers, you know, that's under all of New yeah. England and the, and the Northeast. Well, there was certainly a lot to attract people to the Northwest Territory. Yes. <laughs> and that, that's definitely part of it. So the story that I'm telling today comes largely from a travel account that was written by a a guy who was a kid, he was 10 years old at the time that this travel experience happened, and he was one of the kids in this travel party. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so he was 10 years old at the time. It doesn't get published until the 1880s, many decades later, but he wrote it. It doesn't say exactly when he remembered it and wrote it down, but he was 10 years old when it happened, so he was old enough to have a pretty decent memory. Sure. And it's a very detailed account. And this is what happened. So five families pulled themselves together and decided to travel. And this this kid, Benjamin Palmer, was part of one of those families. So the Pons joined them and and a few other families to take this trip from Vermont eventually to the Ohio River and down to Marietta, which was the first settlement in the Northwest Territory. They started off on September 1st, so after the worst of the heat was gone, but before the, the worst of the weather came, 30 people... Six kids under the age of four. Oh, boy. That's a lot of crying. At yeah, night, you think? yes. I'm just saying. I love babies, but that's a lot of crying. <laughs> so Palmer gives this lovely place-by-place description. We stopped at this place on the first day and this place on the second day. And I can actually follow it with Google Maps. As I got this document, I'm reading this newspaper article or a transcription of it, because that's a lot easier to read than the old newsprint. Sure. And then I open Google Maps, and I put in all these place names, and I can map out this trip that they took. And along the way, of course, there are these place names that have changed. Like, there's no Dykes Settlement anymore. There's no King Settlement anymore. But I can Google those and find out where they were. So they go across the Finger Lakes in New York, in upstate western New York. And then I get to a part of it that I don't believe. This kid who was 10 years old at the time says there was a mile-long bridge across Cayuga Lake in 1801. <laughs> no, come on, a mile-long exactly. bridge. That's what I said, in the Finger Lakes. I'm like, no, okay, so he's really exaggerating. He's I don't really think there was a mile-long bridge when I went to college there in the 70s, you know? <laughs> Guess what? There's not one there now, but there was. Really? I Googled it. I Yeah, I Googled it, and there was a mile-long bridge there. It got washed out like a year later, so it wasn't there for very long. Wow, that's a great story. <laughs> it, yeah, there was a mile-long bridge there, and there's even a nice little picture of it. If you Google it, you'll find this nice little illustration and this description of where it was, so I could see where they crossed. and. So they had these great adventures. They met some awesome backwoods characters. It's kind of like my ancestors' very own version of the Odyssey. <laughs> Meeting really yeah. interesting people along the way who helped them carve out their own canoes and talk through the forest. They spent the night at a Quaker missionary station, and the women and the children got to sleep in the schoolhouse. While they were there, one of the pond kids got really sick, and he was treated by a native healer and his wife who gave him like a his roots that made him expel a bunch of worms and made him healthy again. And oh, he wanted wow. to charge him five dollars for it, but he got him down to fifty cents. <laughs> so this, oh, this, I mean, this, this is a great story. And this me get to my favorite part. And honestly, since the first time I read this, this is the image that stays in my head. So they're on the Ohio River, and they're going down this river, and they're all in canoes, and they lash their canoes together like two by two by two. And I'm quoting from Benjamin Palmer. He says, My father remarked that we were too close together, and if we should get in a ripple, we would have trouble. No sooner said than done, our canoes grounded, and the end of Uncle Peter's ran in between ours and separated them and left most of our good women and children in the river. Oh, boy. The water was from two to three feet deep. Every old lady caught a child as they were swimming by. (laughs) (laughs) Can you picture this? No, this is, well, the like, detail oh, is just, babies. this sounds like a much wilder road trip than any I've ever taken. I guess the question for you is, where did you find this? My dad found it. My dad is an excellent Google genealogist. So he found this a few years back when he was looking for Thaddeus Pond, which is a pretty unusual name. Yeah. And this is very detailed. So we were able to identify him from this because we knew he went from Vermont to Ohio. 
So he found this and sent it to me, and I just had it sitting on my stack of rabbit holes to go down. So it says, every old lady caught a child as they were floating. My sister Jerusha was the only one that came near being drowned, and it was some time before she recovered. Huh. You know, the, the idea that uh, somebody could just go on Google, I think, escapes a lot of folks. You know, folks who are just getting started in genealogy, they think, oh, I've right. got to have this subscription site, and I have to find all these free places and all this. There is nothing more free and easy than Google. And I think uh, no, there is not. <laughs> all of us who so, have done this, this you know, know that Google is an amazing place to find things like this because of all the books that have been digitized. And the story itself originally ran in the Marietta Register, which was a newspaper in the 1880s. And you think, well, then I needed subscription to newspapers or whatever to find it. Well, somebody had transcribed it and put it online. Yeah. And so my dad was able to find it without a newspaper subscription, although I did go back and, and find the original. Because when you find a transcription, you always want to make sure that it's accurate. So yeah. I went back and found it and got a copy of the original and compared it. So most of this really does come from this newspaper account. It's just stunning. And as it turns out, they realized once they caught everybody and they counted everybody up and they got their stuff retrieved, Mr. Pond, it said in the account, had $20 tied up in a white cloth, which was lost in the river. Ooh. And that's a lot, like, probably that was his entire fortune. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Right? Sure. And so when they realized this, everyone's like, yeah, we better go back for that. And so they did. They got a canoe and they went back and rowed out into the river, it said, just below where we were shipwrecked. And the first thing they found was the lost money. So they actually did find it, which really surprises me. That's incredible. She's Sunny Morton. She's a nationally renowned genealogist. You can follow her at SunnyMorton.com. And Sunny, thanks for sharing that. And the tip, too, on what you found. And the idea of actually mapping it out on Google Maps is absolutely genius. And then researching the mile-long bridge and all these places. I mean, you must feel like you went right along with the five families. I really do. And I, I, I have to say that Googling it and then reading other historical travel adventures. You know, David McCullough just published his wonderful book called The Pioneers, and it's yep. about the Northwest Territory. And so I've read that, too. And so now I feel like I have my own Northwest Territory book to insert in his larger <laughs> story of things. Yes. Like one sort of helps me understand the other. And yes, I will feel a little less frustrated next time I'm on my own road trip. And I don't see a Cracker Barrel in sight anywhere, um, or the, <laughs> I can't find an audiobook to listen to or something. I'll remember those six children under the age of four. Looking for an and easy worm, way to show off your family rack, history and share things. it with your family? Thanks so much family for coming on the show again, Sunny. Happy New Year. Custom see you at Roots Tech. Pieces see you and then. And coming up next, I'm going to talk to Curtis Rogers, the founder of JetMatch.com. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started in five minutes on Extreme G. Piece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap .com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
All right, back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. And as you know, last month, big announcement, JedMatch.com was sold to a company in California by its founder, Curtis Rogers. And uh, Curtis is on the line with me right now. Let's talk about it. Hi, Curtis. How are you? Welcome back. How are you, Scott? Pleased to be here again. Well, you have just been quite the pioneer, of course, in this entire industry, creating a third-party site where people can compare their DNA matches from different sites against one another with tools you just can't find anywhere else. And, of course, you had a lot of controversy over the last couple of years, too, with the law enforcement side of things. Tell us about the sale of the website. Who is this new company who has picked it up? The company is Verigen. They are, as far as I'm concerned, the ideal people to purchase GEDmatch. And we did not go out seeking to sell GEDmatch. We've always been approached by many companies. But one of my real criteria, if we were to sell it, was that it had to be someone that would advance GEDmatch for the basis of genealogy. And it had to be someone that was not competitive to the testing companies and whatnot. And Verigen is the ideal company. They are a company that has been dealing with law enforcement. They sell law enforcement supplies for doing DNA testing. They're very familiar with DNA. They've got some real experts. They sell some equipment to law enforcement. They have not been involved in the consumer end of it. Now we've added the consumer end of the business to their operation. So I'm thrilled about this. I really am. Now, do you see this ever where they're going to charge for people to be on GEDmatch? Well, first of all, we charge. (laughs) We charge for tier one. Right. Um, But that is one of the great things about this is that they have said to me that they are not going to increase prices radically for tier one. They are not going to start charging for the free tools that are there now. Their philosophy is that they want to increase the consumer database as much as possible. And they fully understand that if they start doing things that were different than what we're doing, if it's no longer a free site, they're not going to be able to increase that database. Right. Sure. They are out there to do everything they can to follow the same philosophy we were doing in increasing the consumer database. So you talk about their capabilities of uh, taking GEDmatch to the next level. What do you see them doing down the line that you can talk about? Well, for one thing, we have never advertised or promoted, not one penny. I always thought we probably should do that to increase the database. I believe they probably will be doing some advertising on social media. That alone, I mean, you think of us having 1.3 million users, and there's probably been 30 million or 40 million, who knows, people that have actually been tested. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there that can be used to increase our database. Right, and I would imagine that would also help with the police database. Exactly. They just assume that if the consumer database increases, there's going to be a certain percentage that are going to say, yes, we'd like to also be available for police to match their DNA kits against my kit. It's going to happen, a certain percentage, and that's what they're really relying on. That's awesome. So what is the number right now? Of course, back uh, last year, I guess it was, it just it seems like it was so long ago, and yet it wasn't that long ago, that you had to opt out everybody of the one and a quarter million users for police work and then allow them the opportunity to opt back in to make sure that there weren't any uh, conflicts with terms of service moving forward after the case in Utah. So that having happened, how many are you up to now that police are able to take advantage of when it comes to solving cold cases and and violent crimes? We are in excess of 200,000. 200,000 is always a level that I felt that if we reach that, we'd really be back in business. And we are. We are increasing by hundreds every day, and it's working out very well. Okay, so 200,000, though, out of like one and a quarter million, is that really going to be as effective? Um, I believe it is. There's a misconception here. People really can't compare the opt-in figure with our total database because the total database is not what I would call a pure database. We have a lot of duplicate kits in that. We have people who cannot be identified by law enforcement, could never have been used by law enforcement. We have a a category called research where people can put in their kit and they can see other people who match them, but other people can't see theirs. We have a pretty good percentage of people that use that. There's probably close to 50 percent of the people who use an alias. So law enforcement would never be able to figure out who they are. So the law enforcement group is a very, what I would call a pure group. There may be some duplication in there, but 
for the most part, these are all people that can be identified by law enforcement and whose kits can be matched by law enforcement kits. So in all those categories of duplication and hidden identities and all that, of the one and a quarter million, what percent do you think fall into those categories? I think it's over half of them. Really? Okay, yeah. so then you but, could almost... Well, maybe, let's say it's close to half. Not, okay. I don't know if it's over, but it's, it's probably close to half. I, I do know that nearly 50% use an alias. Some of them can be found, I suppose, because they're not also using an email address that is specifically for GEDmatch or an email address that can't be traced. So, you know, it's difficult to tell. Uh, I see. But I really feel about half of them. So that's why the 200000 is probably more valuable than it would seem on the surface. Much more. Much more, Yes. So what is your role with the website now moving forward? It's been sold, it's done, but do you still have an involvement in it? Yeah, it's just been over a little bit of a month. Yes, I do have a contract to consult with them. And in fact, I'm still doing a lot to run the company because we're trying to turn it over to Virgin in a reasonable way. And so I'm still doing a lot to run the company. And you know, I've got to say, I've been very impressed with them keeping their word. I think they've surpassed my hopes for them taking care of the philosophy that we have always followed in GEDmatch. So I'm really pleased. So you're going to have to shut down your operation in Lake Worth, Florida here eventually and (laughs) and send it out to them. And and I would imagine, too, they probably have more security capabilities than, than your little group of volunteers has. Excellent point. Yes, they do. I'll give you an example on just what you just said. We had said that we would not fight if law enforcement were to serve us with a warrant. Now, we did not have the resources to do it. We didn't have the ability to do it. We didn't have the time, the money, whatever. Virgin immediately announced, hey, if we were served with a warrant, we would fight it. There's a good example of how they're surpassing what we were able to do. So people who are concerned because they do sell to law enforcement agencies shouldn't be. Virgin, they've been very honest in in what they've said and supported it. Well, it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Where do you go from here when you're done with this? I mean, you're going to be finished up here pretty soon, I would think, Curtis, in the next year or so. What's next on your plate, especially in the genealogy space? Well, I am now 81 years old. And I've never retired. I've always worked on seven-day jobs, 24-hour jobs. I am kind of looking forward to retiring. I've always <laughs> wanted to. At this point, what I would really like to do is climb on a cruise ship that goes out in the ocean and doesn't make a stop every day and just kind of get away from all of the publicity and requirements. And I'd have to take my computer with me because if I didn't have my computer and if I couldn't do some work, I don't know how I'd handle it. Yeah, I don't know know how you would. I mean, all these years of seven day a week, 24 hours a day, that would be kind of like running into a brick wall at 103 miles an hour, right? Exactly. I'm, I'm afraid I'll wake up some morning and not have something to do. And I'll like, uh-oh, that's it. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> You're done. And, and what about your wife? I mean, how's she going to put up with you having all that free time? Actually, she's famous in her own right. She is an artist. We just got back last week from a new museum show. They're showing her work. And she's had several of these in the last few years. So she keeps busy on her own right. That's awesome. He's Curtis Rogers, the founder of JedMatch.com. Thanks for your time, Curtis. Thanks for your contribution to the space, and we look forward to keeping up with you. You always do a great job. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you anytime. Thanks a lot, Scott. And coming up next, it's another episode of Finding Your Roots on PBS with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, and we're going to talk to Dr. Gates about the latest show that you can catch up on when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as pro 
probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Hey, genies, it is Fisher, and my friends at Memory Web just keep making things better and better. In fact, they just released their new desktop uploaders. Now, what does this mean? Well, they're optimized for speed and ease of use, and they've added some incredible cool things for functionality. For instance, thousands of photos can be uploaded quickly and you'll likely find photos you forgot about or thought you lost. And this happens, you know, pretty much to everybody. Through the uploader, your photos come in automatically tagged with an album name from your last two folders, like 2019 or Thanksgiving. And you can export all the photos from your account with metadata fast. And you can select specific albums of photos to exploit with metadata. Yes, this is the photo app made by family historians for family historians. You got to look into it. Go to memory web.me slash extreme genes that's memory web.me slash extreme genes get 2020 off to a great start with memory web thanks to technology discovering your family's story is easier than ever you can discover yours at roots tech the world's largest family history conference register today for roots tech 2020 don't miss this incredible four-day event february 26 through 29th learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. Use promo code HOLIDAY and get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy, and DNA event, February 20th. 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. All right, we are back. And my good friend, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, is on the line from the PBS show Finding Your Roots. And uh, Dr. Gates, season six is going on right now. Fill us in on the latest episode. The latest episode is called Beyond the Pale. Many people know that phrase, but they don't know its origins. In 1791, Catherine the Great, the empress of the Russian Empire, relegated a 400,000 square mile area in her empire and confined almost 95% of the Jewish people in the empire to that 400,000 square mile space. Wow. So 94% of all the Jewish people in Russia lived in what was called the Pale of Settlement. And hence the expression, you can't go beyond the Pale or beyond the Pale. A Pale was a boundary. It wasn't a literal stake in the ground. Okay. So... Obviously, because of that title, the three guests all descend from Eastern European Jewish ancestors. The actor Jeff Goldblum, whom we all know from Jurassic Park, Independence Day, and The Fly. The classic radio host Terry Gross from Fresh Air. And the comedian and podcaster Mark Marin. Wow. I'll tell you about Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. On Jeff's father's side, Jeff's paternal great-grandfather's name was Zelik Pobarczyk. Immigrated to America in 1911 from a city called Starobin, which is a largely Jewish town that was part of the Pale of Settlement within the Russian Empire. Zelig soon found work in a garment factory and brought his wife and three children over. And because he left in 1911, Scott, I mean, miraculously, they got out just in time because a series of pogroms erupted in Russia a year later in 1912, leaving Starobin burned to the ground. And we're still virtually all of Zelik's extended family who survived the pogroms were murdered in the Holocaust, except for one distant cousin who died serving in the Soviet army and marveling at the luck that allowed his ancestors to survive, to leave one year before that pogrom in 1912, Jeff Goldblum burst into tears. It was deeply, deeply moving. 
Wow. Then we told the story of his maternal grandfather, Sam Tamelli, who was born around 1890 in the town of Zwachuv, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now part of Ukraine. He opened a clothing store in, in Weirton, West Virginia, but he was hit hard by the Depression, and in 1939, he was arrested for setting fire to one of his rental properties to oh, collect the insurance money. <laughs> he had a heart attack during the trial in the courtroom, later dying at home. And Jeff's mother was just 13 years old at oh, the time. Wow. He'd only heard rumors about that story. He says his grandmother would become apoplectic whenever the subject came up. With Mark Marin on Mark's father's line, we discovered that his paternal great-great-grandfather was born in Poland, immigrated in the 1870s, settled briefly in New York, which is a pattern, but then surprisingly in 1880, moved south to Charleston, South Carolina, where he worked as a baker. Morris was part of a wave of northern Jews who headed south because the Civil War had created the need for tradesmen and merchants. Here's the twist. He was working with his son, Barney, but the relationship deteriorated, and in 1896, Morris was the defendant in a lawsuit over an unpaid loan. Oh, and man. And the plaintiff was his own son. <laughs> and the judge ruled that Morris had to pay Barney $1,700, which would roughly equate to over $50,000 today. Wow. Uh, but, you know, you're interested in extreme genes. Mark is 100% Ashkenazi. Terry Gross, 99.8% Ashkenazi. Wow. And Jeff Goldblum, 100% Ashkenazi. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they're all from beyond the pale. They all are from beyond the pale. Great Thank work. you, brother. We'll talk to you again next week. And, of course, uh, PBS is Finding Your Roots is on every Tuesday night. Check your local listings for times. And, of course, you can stream it as well online. And coming up next, another episode of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in three minutes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multi Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie.
All right, we are back on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com doing Ask Us Anything this week. David Allen Lambert is back from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And, uh, David, we have a question from Nancy in Lincoln, Nebraska, and she says, mm. Hey, guys, love your show. I found a report card of my great-grandfather from 1912. How cool is that? <sighs> I'd like to find out more. Is there some place that stores old school records? Thanks. Wow. Good question. Mm. Well, I mean, school records are always fun, especially when you find out that your grandfather was just as bad in math as you were. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> but in this case, for her great-grandfather, the first thing you want to do is obviously contact the local public school system that your great-grandfather was part of. I find contacting the guidance department usually helps, and it usually they're very puzzled that you'd be even interested in records 100-plus years old. Some people would do the basic math and realize that somebody who was in school in 1912 was probably dead because yeah. they probably were born in the 19th century. But you probably have to prove he's dead and better yet, say how you're related because there's usually a form you fill out. In the city of Boston, there's an entire online form from the city archives which has custody of the old school records. And I've done that to find out how dad and mom did in school and some of my deceased aunts and uncles. So it is rather interesting, but you may just find similar things to what you have, the report card. Now, if you're great grandfather went on to high school, there may be in the local historical society a school picture, you know, a graduating sure. class photo. Some schools, maybe not as early as 1912, but a little later, of course, are on websites like Ancestry, which have plenty of yearbooks for the U.S., so you might stumble across that at some point in time. But the best part would be to just look at a town history, see if you can find a picture of the school, to add some color to it. If, in fact, the school department doesn't have the records, and I'll tell you why. In my own hometown, Fish, I only graduated from high school in the late 80s. And back about 10 years ago, as they were getting ready to get rid of the old building, they found all the old records. And you would think, oh, great, I'm with the Historical Society. I can get these all sent over to us. Because there's personal information in there, they had to destroy them. So anybody oh. who was alive that wanted their records had 90 days to go and make a request. Of course, I did, because I didn't want anybody fishing out my bad grades out of a dumpster. <laughs> <place>. <laughs> uh, so there may be some records that do exist for some counties and some school districts, but others that may have been destroyed. I can tell you 30 years ago when I inquired about my own grandmother's graduating records from Milton High School in Massachusetts, I asked about anything they had. They mailed me, Fish, her original report cards from 1909 to 1914. Oh, wow. Signed by my great grandparents. And I treasure them, but I later found out a few years later they dumped all of the records. So I'm glad I made the inquiry. So, Nancy, make that inquiry now. That's true. And you're right. There's so many places that have gotten rid of the records. Why store something from 70, 80, 90 years ago? But you never know. That's the thing about this whole hobby is that you never know what might be out there unless you ask. And that's the important mm -hmm. thing. So take care of that. Thank you so much for the question, Nancy. And of course, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can email us at Ask us anything at ExtremeGenes.com. David, thank you so much. Talk to you later. Well, what a show. And thanks to all the guests who made it so great. Sonny Morton, of course, the professional genealogist who talked about adding detail to your family stories, as she did with hers, the one she shared with us. If you missed it, by the way, you got to catch it again. Listen to the podcast version of the show on Extreme Genes, iTunes, or iHeartRadio. Also to Curtis Rogers coming on and talking about Jed Match and his recent sale of the website to a great company in the West who sounds like they're ready to do a lot of good things on our behalf. Also to Dr. Henry Lewis Gates from PBS's show Finding Your Roots, talking about the latest episode in season six. And to David, who lends his expertise every week. We will talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family.